Good evening and welcome to Books and Books and Miami Book Fair's Evening with Presentation. I'm Christina and I'm thrilled to be with you here tonight. Many of you have been watching since we went virtual last month. We've joined forces with Miami Book Fair to bring you this series and we'd like to thank the folks at Lit Hub and Culture Crusaders for their collaboration too. Mitchell is watching from home and sends his best regards. Everyone at Books and Books and Miami Book Fair are thinking of you and hoping that you and your families are healthy and well. We miss seeing you in person, but we love seeing you here. Tonight, we're celebrating the debut of a wonderful new novel called The Ghosts of Harvard by Francesca Saratella. Francesca is the New York Times bestselling author of a nine book series of essay collections co-written with her mother, best-selling author, Lisa Scottolini. They're based on Chick Witt, their Sunday column in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Francesca graduated cum laude from Harvard University, where she won multiple awards for her fiction, including the Thomas T. Hoops Prize. Jody Picot says, every time I thought I knew where Ghost of Harvard was heading, I turned out to be wrong. Part mystery, part ghost story, part psychological thriller, this novel is all entertainment. Harlan Coben says, Francesca Saratella is my new go-to author. Wow, what a lively, compelling, and intoxicating debut. The book is set at Harvard University, where a Harvard freshman is obsessed with the suicide of her schizophrenic brother. Then she starts hearing voices. Does she share her brother's illness or is she tapping into something else? We're going to find out more tonight. For our discussion this evening, Francesca is joined by her mother, Lisa Scottolini, who really doesn't need much of an introduction. For those who don't know, Lisa is a New York Times best-selling and Edgar Award-winning author of 32 novels. She has 30 million copies of her book in print in the US and has been published in 35 countries and you can find all of her books at Books and Books. I was chatting with Francesca and Lisa earlier today, and they were telling me stories about shopping at our Miami Beach store. Both of them are longtime customers who have a deep appreciation for independent bookstores. I'll take this time to remind you that you can order Francesca's new novel by clicking on the button on the bottom of the screen below. Every order is helping us to keep it to keep us in business, so thank you. And now, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Francesca Saratella and Lisa Scottoni. Here we go. <laughs> it worked. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm Lisa Scottolini, and I gave birth <laughs> to this incredible, adorable, amazing daughter who is, well, my favorite author and has been since the age of zero. This is Francesca Saratella. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and so excited to be part of this wonderful book and books event. This is just we, so special. Yes, we have some things you want to say first, which is a lot of love for books and books. Yes. We, my mother lived in Miami with my brother and you grew up in the Lincoln Road store. And fun fact, my grandmother's old phone number was just a like one digit off of books and books. Right. So occasionally she would cus field customer calls and you know, only gently encourage them to the latest Lisa Scottolini. Right, sure. she would like tell them that, that she wouldn't hang up the phone unless they bought one of my books and books and books. And God bless Mother Mary, God bless Mitchell Kaplan, God bless books and books. And thanks to all of you who keep it so vital. I've in 30 year career, I've watched it grow and just become one of the dominant and most wonderful thriving indies in the whole country. So Independent true. bookstores matter so much to us and I know they do to you. So please support them and thank you for this opportunity. Um, okay, so I'm the proud mom, so I have to get through this without like crying or lactating, which will be very How scary. many minutes did we get before a lactation joke? I'm, uh, four minutes and 50 seconds. I get up, but, but no, we're gonna, this is going to be very serious, and you're going to be impressed with that professionalism. Right. But, but I want to do begin um, 
by saying that this book got a wonderful, you know, you, it's like one of those ones they said in Reading Rainbow, like you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, in the Washington Post, Maureen Corrigan of NPR Fresh Air, I mean, what else do you want? Raved and raved, called Ghosts of Harvard, beguiling, sweeping. I'm going to read the sentence. Let me read the so sentence. Nice. Ghosts of Harvard is a rich, intricately plotted thriller that gathers suspense velocity as Katie runs through the maze-like <laughs> halls of academe and the winding streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, chasing after clues to the more sinister circumstances of her brother Eric's death. <laughs> what do you want? Was that your questions? You just no, asked? that was not my questions. Here's my question. Anyway, questions. I was so touched that she, and honored that she said that. And it's really nice to have somebody not blood related to me who was excited about the book and enjoyed it. <laughs> but still, we do not negate blood relations. We begin. Um, so let's talk normally. I uh, talk normally. I am. That's the problem. Um, let's be, here's the book, actual book itself, which I will hold. Oh. Tell us Sorry. what Ghost of Harvard is about, Francesca, well, offspring of mine. So we can see. Ghost of Harvard is, you know, it's mom. Sorry. It, it's behave. Ghost of Ghost of Harvard is, you know, it's a lot of different things. It's part psychological thriller, part sort of supernatural mystery, even a little historical elements. But I really feel that at its heart, it is a family story. Um, it follows the story of a sister, Cadence Archer, who is really struggling in the aftermath of her older brother Eric's suicide. She adored him, she worshipped him, she looked up to him and wanted to be just like him. And he went to Harvard and sadly, while there, um, ultimately was diagnosed with schizophrenia, really struggled with mental illness affecting him, and sadly ultimately took his own life on campus. And she's really struggling with how how did what do you do when your hero makes a choice that you can't possibly understand and she decides to attend harvard herself because she feels that there are so many unanswered questions about his final year and while she's trying to piece that together she fears she's losing her grip in reality herself she starts to hear voices and then the new question is am i losing my mind like my brother or are these voices something else she begins to believe they're ghosts and if she listens to them Will they bring her to the one ghost she craves most, her brother, or will they lead to her own self-destruction? That's the plot of Ghosts of Harvard. And Good answer, <laughs> excellent answer, starting with the bang. Okay, now, let's, so let's go to some questions. Um, really central to this thing is, to this novel, is um, Katie's relationship to her older brother, Eric, who has schizophrenia. And I'm just saying that I think you handled this portrayal of schizophrenics and, and the and mental illness really sensitively and compassionately. And all the reviews said that too. Um, I'm curious why you chose schizophrenia. Like, where did that come from? Um, well, first, thank you for saying that you felt and other people felt that it was handled sensitively. That was extremely important yeah. to me because I feel that schizophrenia especially is so, so sensationalized, misunderstood and like so many mental illnesses, stigmatized in a way that is just hurting everyone. And um, I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to um, show an honest but compassionate perspective. And part of that's, you know, he's not defined in this book by his diagnosis, right. nor is he defined by his final moments, which is another thing I think happens to victims of suicide. Um, the reason, and the reason for that is because he's, this whole book is told through a sister's perspective and she sees him in that beautiful, full context and empathy of a sister who's grown up with him. She knows what part was him and what part was illness. Although of course she also struggles with differentiating the two. And I chose schizophrenia also because um, this is an, I learned this interesting factoid that sort of got my imagination going, which is that schizophrenia has a higher occurrence in genius IQ. And that really got me thinking about the ways that, you know, are is, Genius is the potential for greatness, also a potential for greater vulnerability, is sort of a, a more finely tuned or highly tuned mind, um, somehow more susceptible to other things. And, you know, we class, we're, we tend to really over categorize as like anything atypical is bad, anything, you know, and normal is the best. But, right. you know, it's like, where does that line really fall? And, you know, that's that's what got me thinking about it and why I wanted to explore some of these themes that really encroach in everybody's lives, whether they struggle with a mental illness like this or not. 
Right. You know, it's interesting because I think that the book succeeds on the family drama level and also in a way thriller because you're worrying about what's going to happen. Like you turn the pages and that's something else the reviewers said. Now in the family, I, we love family stories because we love families. Cause it's, <laughs> and, um, and I always think it's interesting that families have roles. The people in the family sort of sometimes adopt a role. And that for people who don't know, like this is our whole entire family. Like that's, know, not, that's not really well, true. Well, I'm a single but, mom and you're the only. Right, we have a small family. It's we true. have a very small family. If you fit on a screen, you're like a small family. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so how does, but how do you think, like, let's talk about the role of the family, Katie's role. She's the main character. Oh, let me answer. Oh, let me answer. I just, oh, let me tell you I just, I just, I just subtly muttered to her, great, let me answer. But then she had to amplify that. That wasn't the point. But, sorry. <laughs> What I was going to say is that, you know, even in a small family, I don't think we are immune to roles. We have this funny role where you're the little wacky, cr crazy one, and I'm the straight man, and that's our roles. And, you know, I think um, every family has an equilibrium. Every family has, uh, like you said, sort of roles. Um, and sometimes families, I think, gain a little bit of degree of myth, you know, if and this family originally and for the longest time, Eric was the golden child. He was the superstar. And Katie was the second banana. And what was unique, though, about this is it wasn't sibling rivalry. It She was very comfortable in that supportive role. And that's where she was used to. And she was used to him being the gold standard and her being a little, enjoyed the cover of the background. And first, that got disrupted when he gets ill. That changes the entire dynamic, although he was still somewhat the center, the son of this orbiting family right. of where... First, they were all celebrating him. Now they're all worrying about him, trying to get him help, trying to control him to a certain degree. Right. You know, it's very reactive. I think family is so reactive. And that's why I wanted to explore the way that a tragedy like this does not happen to one person in a family. It happens to the entire unit. This family will forever be a family of four with now one chair that's empty. It's never going to fully change. But for Katie, it does, to the extent that family can define identity, it does need to change because she can no longer only be Eric Archer's little sister, or at the very least, that meaning has now changed really greatly. And I think we see her struggling with that identity shift, struggling with what relational identity shift. And right. you know, I think those roles in a family sometimes, in the best circumstance, are sort of this helpful emotional scaffolding, which bolsters us while we are developing ourselves. But sometimes, the expectations of family, the assumptions of family can become really confining and it can put you in a small little box and she's dealing with both. Right. Now, it brings us to naturally that sort of sad that Eric passed by suicide mm -hmm. on Harvard's campus. And when Katie goes to the school, she's going to try to investigate, gee, you know, because she's full of what ifs. What made you, suicide is very, very important. And a, and a, not an easy subject, like in a debut novel. And when you, I think it's really, I give you a lot of credit for being ambitious. What made you want to write about something like that? And how did you research it? I mean, I wanted to, I was acutely aware that I am not a suicide survivor. And that, interestingly, is the term for somebody who has lost an immediate family member. I think it's interesting that the survivor term is even for loved ones. I think it's really reflective of how intimately affecting that type of this particular loss is. Um, so I was really acutely aware that I had not experienced this in my immediate family. And I was imbued with this extra motivation to make sure that I got it right for people, because I know this is incredibly common and sadly, very common among young people. And I think it's something as a whole country we're really struggling with. I think a lot of part of that struggle is the stigma and shame that unfairly surrounds this type of loss and can isolate that family. You know, nothing helps community better, I mean, grief more than community. And sometimes with a suicide, because people think they're right. respecting privacy, right. they keep their distance and that's really sad. Um, what was interesting about this was I've been asked, you know, did you interview families who had lost somebody to suicide? And I made an, a, a choice early on to never do that. That was, I don't think I'm entitled to that. I don't think I am entitled to somebody's real life, serious grief that way for the sake of a, a novel, no matter how seriously I take it. It's just a made up story. And that's, so I made the decision to really research it heavily, but from a respectful distance, I read countless articles. I read grief counseling books. I read 
um, memoirs, I try to absorb it to inform my natural powers of empathy as much as I could, but I never wanted to mine that type of pain uh, for a book. And what I didn't anticipate though, was how once I started talking about working on this novel, because of course I was working on it the whole time that we were writing the other books, right. which were so different in tone. There are these funny essay collections and we would be on tour for them. And inevitably on tour, somebody would say, you know, are you working on anything else? Are you working on a novel? And I used to pause because I didn't want to, you know, this is a heavier topic. I don't think it's like a drag book, but it's not emotional. It's, it's different exciting. in tone. Yeah. And I was worried about shifting the tone in the room. Right. Or maybe bringing the mood down. And every time I learned quickly, I didn't need to worry about that because the mood didn't move down. It moved closer. I felt everybody sort of lean in, listen, open their hearts. And then in the signing line, even when everybody was all smiles again and all happy and hugging, and they and they certainly were, but people would also take me aside privately and go, you know, I'm really, I'm interested in that book you're writing, or I'm glad that you're writing about that topic because my father, my sister, right. my college best friend was lost to suicide. And it really then, I, of course I knew it was common or I wouldn't have been interested. It has certainly affected my life tangentially, but to really feel just how, this tragedy affects good families, loving families, wonderful families. It is right. not a comment on the person or the family. It's of so course. common and it really happens a lot. You know, it's interesting because so part of what happens to Katie is that she starts to hear voices and we can't tell if it's an auditory hallucination or it's actually a ghost. There are, there are well, spirits in this book that are ghosts. And I think it's very interesting because they're not the typical ghosts. For example, one, which I love to learn things in books, even in fiction and in a thriller and a really exciting book. And in this novel, for example, one of the ghosts, I, there's a lot of twists, so I'm not gonna give yeah, them. Yeah, I'm like, where are we spoiling? Where are we No, going? well, there is one that is actually, it was an enslaved person at Harvard. That's true. Who was, which I did not know that Harvard had slaves. Um, can you tell, talk a little, like, how did you know that? Because I did not know that. Yeah, well, right, I mean, Harvard does have a history with slavery, which is something that has actually just come out and um, as recently as 2016, they were looking into it when I was around 2010. Um, it's not as if that they knew that or were actively suppressing it as much as tragically this was at the, this was, would have been in 1760s, the set by 1750s, 1760s, so before even 10 years about before the nation was founded. Um, there were at the Harvard president's residence enslaved people. And sadly, there was so little credit and due given to those people's lives in every capacity that there were no records kept. So for years that was able to be, for, for you know, centuries, it was able to yeah. be sort of gently erased from the progressive, you know, what we think, everything we think about Harvard as being the center of progress and American idealism. And indeed at the same time, that there were enslaved people serving the Harvard president. He was, you know, part of the, right. the thought process and part of the rooms where it happens, where they were devising the very principles that our nation was founded on. And they were grappling with slavery to the crown, meaning taxation. And all those topics were swirling, and yet they had this utter blind spot right. for the people serving in their really home. Um, and I just, I really wanted to incorporate that one because i think all of these ghosts are sort of refractions of potential destroyed which is i think something that happens is both true of suicides and then i wanted to think of different versions and i think racial discrimination is what a, a major right. source of potential right. destroyed in this country and i wanted to show that you know the hands that built harvard university were not just of white men that that that's not the case and to me this book really examines the way we have our personal histories and our personal narratives, and we have our national narratives, but we don't always know what is being left out. We don't, or we don't, right. you know, we right. learn these stories. We think that a more simplified narrative is easier to understand, easier to remember. But when you are leaving voices out and leaving perspectives out, um, you're not, you're just not getting the truth. Right. And so this, I think, I don't mean to, I'm not turning the reputation of Harvard on its head. It's not right. a racist place. 
it is, but it is a fuller picture of its history well, and its truth. Fiction is at core about truth, which is what's so great about it. Um, interestingly, one of the other ghosts is super hot. Like there is a romance in here. You can't even Look, see it. There's them. a super hot guy you and can't. there's a super hot ghost. It's kind of like they both look like Bradley Cooper in my mind, but you know, I mean, I, I've never seen like a love triangle with a ghost before. I think this book, one of the things I love about this book is its originality. I'm curious, you know, listen, you haven't lived till you read a love scene that your daughter wrote. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you get hot in here? <laughs> um, confess. Like, confess. <laughs> I have no shame about this. I mean, listen, no, of course. I wanted to write a book I hadn't read yet, and she's a young woman. She's a young woman in college, and she as you say, has a, a meets a, a living, tempting guy and is hearing the voice of somebody who, you know, is also piques her interest. I mean, what girl out there hasn't longed for a more romantic past, right? I mean, I'm on the apps. You get the swiping and the, that's the true romance that we're delivering. You know, uh, one of the ghosts is, you know, he's a, he's a lover of jazz. He's a lover of this. He's... It, they're all um, sexy. Well, no, the, fun, the irony, of course, well, me. let me just say, the irony, of course, is that you don't see them. The character, she only hears them. That's true. And there's this whole question is whether or not they're auditory hallucinations. And I think even as she slips more deeply into the, wor this, the world of these voices that she's hearing, they, they're coming to her from different moments in history. They seem to see her and receive her in their world as if she were just a normal contemporary of theirs, but for her, she only hears these echoes of them. Um, she, I, I mean, I'm playing with that duality the whole time where she's slipping into it, right. but on the flip side, you could also argue that she's an incredibly lonely girl under enormous stress with a genetic predisposition to mental illness and schizophrenia delusions. And she starts hearing, you know, uh, a guy who sounds a lot like her brother a, a boyfriend or crush and you know a, a, a young woman who's in worse trouble than she is right and is she just are we is this just self-soothing is this imaginary friends or is she leaning into it you know and that's sort of i want you to both go with her and then occasionally catch yourself and doubt and go are we getting too far with these ghosts right and part of what she's dealing with too is the harvardness i remember when you when you got in and we were all like so happy and everything. And I took you were you napping. I woke her from a nap. She was like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we went there and they have a magazine and the magazine is called H bomb. That's you know, right. Yeah, that true. Yeah, totally. And I was like, there is some, some alternative mag. I don't know. Well, I just remember, but the point is that, you know, Harvard is viewed with about so much potential. Like you were in the dorm that JFK was in. And I was like, Wow, that's so cool. What? JFAK was JF that. <laughs> JFK. No, right. And of course, the H bomb. Oh, so hot. I would never have told that H bomb story because I think it's kind of gross, but it is a reference to the idea that after you drop the H bomb and say you went to Harvard, people might receive you differently or receive a resume differently. It feels a little icky to talk about. At the same time, there's some degree that it's undeniably true. There's a lot of, um, there's, it's a, Harvard is a character the moment I set foot on campus long before I ever wrote a book about it. That's the truth. And I think the biggest misconception and why I say it's a little icky is I feel I still feel self-conscious about this misconception, which is that everybody who went to Harvard must be super full of themselves and feel like they're smart, the smartest person in the room or feel arrogant or whatever that might be. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It is the most humbling place, which is really what this book is about in the sense that it's where it's a place where genius is, and I'm not saying I'm a genius, but geniuses go to feel dumb, right? Because <laughs> it's you know they they have a little joke where I think every nervous freshman gets on there, and every single one is like, "Holy crap! How did I get here? How am I possibly going to be worthy of this?" And they literally sit us all down on the first couple of days and go, "You're not the admissions mistake," because you all feel like that. I mean, and, and at some degree, it's because it. It must be kind of arbitrary. Of course, you know, I, I worked hard to have like whatever stats, but when I got in, it was even it was easier now. But I think the acceptance rate is below five percent. That means they could fill the class ten times over, twenty times over, without the caliber of student really dropping. Uh, that means you got lucky. If you got in, you deserved it, but you also got lucky. It felt to me like 
a ridiculous mistake. We remember I didn't even want to apply. I thought it'd be as a waste of the application money. Um, it felt like winning the lottery ticket, except that it comes with this expectation of you just got the golden ticket. Don't blow it. And you know, you think you're good at computer science? Are you the next Mark Zuckerberg? Oh no, then you're then you've let us down. <laughs> you uh, English major, you know? Oh, you like poetry? Are you the next next T. S. Eliot? Oh, you're not. You're not ready to publish the Wasteland at like 21. Oh, forget it. Then you're a loser. I mean, you cannot. It's like you can't live up to this legacy of the past, which Harvard never lets you forget their famous grads. And you have all this pressure on your future. And I think young people especially already feel like every choice is so consequential. Like if I don't get into that college, my whole life is ruined. If I don't get into that law school, my whole life is ruined. It's it's this it's this real place where time closes in on you and it's a real pressure cooker. And um, and that figures into the book. Absolutely. Because it affects I mean, Katie and, and her brother as well. I mean, they're both, you know. And also history. It's interesting because uh, I love... Look, you're a smart audience, and I love, I think fiction nowadays, we are all writing better, even in the context of a really exciting book, I love learning something. And I think this book is sort of steeped in history, the history of Harvard, which also happens to be the history of the country. When you were there, I mean, you use that in this book so well, I think setting really matters because it grounds characters and makes them makes the book work and makes you feel close to them. Did you feel the weight of that history? Because I thought it was really effective. When I was there? Yes. As a student, yeah, it's it's both. It's that weird, uneasy juxtaposition, and that's really what inspired me the most. Is that on the one hand, it's also a normal college with normal kids who are drinking underage out of their red solo cups and trying to catch the eye of the cute guy in their lecture section, and waking up in grubby dorm rooms with popcorn that smell of popcorn forever for no reason, right? Like it's a normal college. It's all about youth and future and potential. And then at the same time, for any place that is founded in 1636, where everything is old and not just steeped in history, but honestly steeped in death. Um, so many buildings are memorials. The Widener Library what is the plaque right on the front. It explains that Widener drowned in the, t the sinking of the Titanic. Um, there's a colonial cemetery right across the street. In this book, I have you know reference a lot of the epitaphs on the tombstones, not a single one was fictionalized by me. I went there and I looked at them. And indeed there are tombstones, just a stone's throw outside of Harvard Yard where all the freshmen live that say, young friends prepare for sudden death. I mean, um, you know, there's the memorial church honoring the war dead. I mean, it's it's very, many of the memorials are beautiful, but almost all of them are memorials. And it sort of brings this message home of you're, you're young, but you are not timeless and the like death is inevitable. The only path to immortality is success. And that's, that's like a staggering well. pressure on your <laughs> average 19 year old. That's very hard to shake off. Yeah, if I can, because there's a great sentence in here. It says, um, for her, Harvard wasn't a college. It was a haunted house. And today she was moving in. That's, that's where really more her compelling. personal history. I mean, right. it's where her personal history is, is unique. Right. But yet her personal history and her personal tragedy at, and connection to Harvard is only amplified by the rest of the school. Let's turn for a minute since we're get, getting near the end to, uh, to the writing process. Now, you and I have written nonfiction right. together that, as you say, is really funny and jokey and talks we about have. bras and, <laughs> well, mostly bras. Um, how was it different to, you know, then you really had, you switch gears and you worked on it so long and so hard. And for a long time, she wouldn't let me read it. And uh, I was so excited when I finally did read it. It's dedicated to me. <laughs> anyway, that a secret what's piece. the difference between writing nonfiction that's humor and fiction that's so dramatic and compelling and moving? Oh, so I mean, it's quite a transition. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, they're like completely different animals, right. but the skills are honed in each for the other. You know, um, I think sometimes I really focus on the difference of length. This book is quite beefy. It's not slow. I worked incredibly hard to make it move fast, but it's a thicky. And the columns are frequently between 800 and 1200 words. And when I, I think um, one, it was so, it was just so satisfying and buoyed me. And I really want to thank all the readers of our essay collections together yeah. because getting to do those, have, have those books come out more frequently, have the newspaper column come out more frequently, allowed me to get this wonderful feedback and support the entire time through 
while I was working on this novel, which was just so spiritually important and so much of writing is a mind game. So your spirit really matters. And I always knew, you know, I had these wonderful readers who were waiting for me to finish it. So um, I'm incredibly grateful and thank, thank you all for that. Um, so that was really nourishing. But also I think that skill of learning to cut it down into some writing adage, if I'd had more time, I would have written it shorter. Um, is that, that what that gets at is that it's really hard to be concise and it's hard to be economical with your words, but it's necessary. And I, I really cut my teeth with that on the column and those newspaper word counts, which are very unforgiving. And then I applied that skill to this book so that this book is not meandering and that every revision was to make it tighter right. and shorter. And that's also, you know, I learned the, I learned from the best, a page turning right here. So I know <laughs> and I guess important. we should leave it with, do you have, you know, because probably a lot of people uh, are interested in writing. We're big encouraging, like everybody's got a story, write it. Do you have any advice for young writers? Because really you, this is it, your debut. I mean, you worked hard and here you are and it's great acclaim. And the best advice I ever received was from a Harvard professor of creative writing who told me, give yourself permission to take yourself seriously. I think what that really gets at is there are so many things in life where you don't get to do the big project until you get tapped for the job. You, somebody else chooses you and goes, I want to assign you to this. Um, with fiction, when you're starting out, you get to assign it to yourself. And the real challenge is that you have to be your own validation feedback loop. And you have to be that, you give yourself the permission. You say, you, you are good enough to write this. Because so many people, I think, have a wonderful idea in their minds and they get started with it, but then it, when it, the going gets tough or they're struggling, they think, well, I'm just, I must be struggling because I'm not good enough at this and I should just stop. This is embarrassing to me. Listen, everybody struggles with it. It does not mean you're doing it wrong. I, I, I So many years of revising and ups and downs with this book and that's just part of it. But you deserve to give yourself a real shot, whether that means you know carving out a time of your day, having to set limits on friends or family, and say, you know what, I, I'm I'm taking myself seriously with this, and I'm taking my process seriously. Right. Just to end, I really want to. I agree with like what she said, because here she's written her first novel. I I'm on my thirty second, and I still sit in front of the computer and curse and <laughs> and worry and can't do it, and you know have all that insecurity come up. Writing is not easy, but I think there's so many people who. We all tell great stories. You mean after this, somebody go, how was the chat? You'll tell a story. How was your day? I feel like the hair was so frizzy. Oh, my God. That's what they'll say. So, you know, I, I just really want to encourage people, too. I think it's the more voices, the better. Um, and, and when I say really that it took that. me, you know, 10 years to write this book, I don't want anybody to be daunted by that. If I had been more confident, more free, maybe it would, maybe it would have taken me less time. I don't know how much of that time was writing time versus <laughs> You know, let that encourage you that A, that if your project is taking you longer than you thought, it doesn't mean you're failing at it. It just means it's taking longer. And likewise, you know, that it's, right. it's just so, yeah. It I takes just, what it takes, exactly, exactly. Well, thank you, Francesca. This is like, <laughs> actually, I don't know a lot of this stuff, so this is sort of really, really fun for me. So. Okay, so we have some questions from the audience. Um, here's the one that has a lot of votes. Um, what made you select the ghosts for your story and how much research did you have to do in order to bring them into the story? That's such a good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, like I said, my, at the outset, I knew that I was, because I felt that the loss of suicide is really this tragic loss of potential um, and really gets at the duality of potential that, um, potential for greatness, for success in the context of mental illness, potential to get better, but also it has this kind of the darker side of where a big, what should be a launch pad can feel like a precipice, you know, the potential to, to get worse, to suffer, you know, it, it has the potential to inherit a mental illness. I wanted to examine these times of potential cut short and, uh, I started thinking, you know, without giving too much away about about war, about history, you know, other times in history where potential has been cut short. And I thought about war time, and I thought about discrimination and slavery. Now, the interesting thing, actually, I should correct myself. I did not think of slavery at the outset because, like I told you, that history was really not discoverable anywhere when I started writing the book. But I was interested in the themes of discrimination, so I already had had 
a ghost character who was completely different, who um, was a, a young black woman who was employed by the school as a goodie, which was this weird period in the 1880s where they had like indentured servitude young women. That was odd. And I had done all this research into that history. I sold the book with that character in it. And it was only when I was revising it um, with my editor that then it popped up on my Harvard alert on the New York Times news that this slavery, this history of slavery was being revealed. And then suddenly I thought, oh my God, it was like fiction had become reality because this whole book is about the way that we, history has has been edited, whether we know it or not. And sometimes, you know, we say hindsight is 2020, but we don't know. It depends on whose perspective is telling the hind has the hindsight. And then suddenly I realized like, oh my God, my book, if I keep this character as it was of an underpaid person, but a paid person yeah. is whitewashing this, the reality. Right. And I said, you know, I think I have to rewrite this entire character and this entire subplot. And my editor was like, you really don't have to. But I felt that I did because it was just the principle of the book. It was the meaning of the book. And it was even a truer example of it. So I took the time, I delayed the book and I completely did new research into that um so and i used the harvard archives i used uh, the great thing about researching fiction is you get to just follow whatever little breadcrumbs and veins interest you you know um this book is not an authority in any in fuller sense but it's i did do a, i had a lot of time reliable, i did do though. copious research yes of course. there's no yeah there's no um any of like the anecdotes given in the story are all factual for the most part Okay, so so Linda would like to know, how much did your own experience at Harvard influence the story? That's such a good question. Thank you. Um, that's one of those things where I, when I started it, I would have been like, oh, not at all. This is so completely different. Obviously, this has this tragedy at the heart of it, which, you know, I wasn't grappling with. But really, I mean, my certainly my experience crept in. Um, in in small ways like that, you know, the characters always live in dorms that I lived in. Um, there's one professor who uh, who's very nasty in this book, and he's based off an even nastier real life professor who used to curse us out in red pen in the margins. Um, you know, so I, I got to sort of get my revenge. I also had, you know, a, a prof the, the wonderful professors are also based on real professors. So I had both. Um, I, uh, I did, you know, when I was a senior, I did get invited by a guy who was this, who was like really great at math, um, to an evening at the astronomical observatory. He invited me, and I knew he kind of had a crush on me. And I was dating this idiot, an idiot who also went to Harvard. But I was dating this guy at the time who was younger. And my friend, who's in our little in this it, watching us now, will be like, "You should have dumped him before." I didn't dump him. <laughs> I tolerated his wasting my time, and. When he was done that the year and we were still there because we we're seniors are a little bit longer, we were technically still together. I got invited to go to the observatory at midnight with his secret key card, and I declined out of loyalty and good girlfriendness. <laughs> and then um, I graduated, and a week later, the guy dumped me. I never even saw him face to face. Called me, broke up with me, and I should have gone to the observatory. So I but got to. I got to go got to the. I got to relive it and go to the observatory in this novel, and it was like a really. It was great. Okay, other questions about Francesca's dating life. Yeah, <laughs> I love to hear all this. <laughs> so here's one from Debbie. How much quote unquote guidance, aka motherly annoyance, did you get from Lisa? during the development and writing of ghosts. Well, that is, you're nailing it. So whoever said that you're exactly right. Um, that, you know, it's like what we said, I did not have my mom read the book because I, well, A, I knew we would fight. No, but I was like, no, um, I wanted to keep her as mom. You know, uh, I admire her writing skills so much. I've learned so much from reading her and watching her work for my entire life. Um, but you only yeah. get one mom. You know, and you can get plenty of critics. And when you're giving, you know, I, you have to be a little protective when you're all vulnerable and unpublished. And, you know, it's easy to get your confidence knocked. So I wanted to have that soft mom cheerleader character in my life so that when I called her, you know, we talked constantly about the book, about writing the book emotionally, that kind of stuff. But we did not talk about, you know, 
I didn't have you read it because I wanted to be able to call you late at night and go, oh, mom, I think I'm the worst writer in the world. And she would say, you know, no, honey, you're wonderful. Not, you know, no, but chapter four really lags. Like I didn't need that. So I wanted to just keep it oh, no, nice and, and soft. And I was fine with that because honestly, I did not, I wanted that dedication, man. And I did not want to jeopardize my dedication. So I, when she was home, I would bring snacks. because That's what moms do. Try to get her to get good sleep. You didn't even have any competition. It was in the bag. Snacks. I brought just snacks. The, the dedication was in the bag. You take nothing for granted. So <laughs> Becky would like to know, how have you been surviving the quarantine? Have you been inspired to write or do you find it hard to create? That's such a good question. You know, so, so many of us are all dealing with such weird disruption. And I think mine is probably relatively small, but it's not nothing. I normally live in Manhattan. I live on my own. I have a vibrant life like we all did until this happened. And now I'm plunked in my childhood home with my she mom loves every in rural minute. Pennsylvania. And I'm so grateful and lucky that we are together and that we can be out here and with some beautiful nature around, but it's a real, it's a real change. And it came so unexpectedly for all of us. I brought about two weeks, one week's worth of underwear. So I'm doing a lot of laundry, um, wearing clothes from my high school days. So um, <laughs> that's weird. It's been um, so exciting to be doing this virtual launch for this book. And I've been actually so pleasantly surprised. And it's really thanks to readers and potential readers like you guys for making it so special that it has felt surprisingly connected, even though we are all in this social isolation. Um, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for that. I haven't, I'll tell you, I haven't been getting that much writing done. I am supposed to be working on, I am working on the next book, don't worry. I'm working on it. It's contracted. It's happening. It's not a sequel to Ghosts, but if you enjoyed Ghosts, I know you're going to love this one. And I'm really, I'm hoping to try and find my quarantine mental zen so that I can get back to that creative power. But I think to everybody out there, if you're not working at your full capacity, you know, firing in all cylinders, be kind to yourself. This is a time right. where we're all going through really hard challenges and have just the background noise of so much difficulty and strife that just be compassionate to yourself and to others. Right, agree. We know how lucky we are to have each other. And something like this really reminds us, it's so great to see these little you know, people weighing in and that you did this, Christine, and books and books. You guys have done so much for Miami and we really believe that books bring people together. And I and I and we think they heal too. Yeah. So um, <laughs> this is really a hard time for so many people and we really appreciate you having us on to talk about those. Oh Thanks so much to you. So let's take one more. Um, someone is curious about what your writing routine is, Francesca. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? The writing routine. Yeah, I can give shout out to this one that one of the best, most important skills to my writing process that I learned from my mom was to write with a word count goal. That has just been so key to, like I said, the mind games that you have to play with yourself in order to really free yourself to be as creative and productive as possible. And for me, word count goals are so important to have this sort of empirical, objective measure of your productivity that day, rather than a more emotional one. Because if you're like me, at the end of every day, if it was just the question is, you know, was I a good enough writer that day? Was I good enough today? That's, that's a hard one to feel, or that's Really what it is, is it's susceptible to so much else. You know, so much of this book is about how our perception is impacted by so many things that are that are in our, you know, in reality dimension, in an emotional dimension, in every kind of dimension. So um, that's so malleable and it's so vulnerable. But whether you hit, did I hit 500 words today or not? That's simple. And you can really adjust it to whatever pace you're right. working at at the time. You know, my mom... She's a pro. She gets works at an incredible clip, like 2,000 words a day. I don't know if I ever, I mean, not ever, but I could not regularly do that. I regularly worked at 1,000 words a day. And if it's the beginning of a book or the beginning of an idea, 500 words a day. Um, if you write 300 words a day, that's one page. That might seem like nothing, but believe me, but by the time a year's out, you'll have a whole novel. And it's all that, you know, sort of get it down, get it good kind of thing. So that's that's my writing secret and my restaurant process is i i'm again to quote that old professor he always told me be blue collar about it he said punch your time card and i think what he was getting at was to not give in to this romantic notion that creative work should be happening when the muse you know inspires you and 
you'll just be like rush of words all through the night like that if that happens chase it love it live it you know go with god but a lot of times creativity is a discipline and it's a practice and it's a job and i learned that from you you know seeing your perseverance and your workmanship with it like that that's just what it takes and i actually think it's empowering because it means it's not some mystical thing for the exclusive few it's a it's a a craft that you can get better at and you just have to keep working at it so um mm -hmm. i i work on normal hours i you right. know knock off at, at night and you know, hang out, always, always at home, always working home, always with my dog, always, always with snacks. Dog. He's snoring now. I, I listen to music, him. but you um, are your TV queen. You always have the TV, TV on. Um, do you want to show him the dog before we go? He's sound asleep. He's snoring, so we've been, well, I've been wondering the whole time if you can hear him. Yeah. He's a this little, is one, this is my writing. Oh, how cute. This is Pip. Oh my God. <laughs> Expectations. He's my sleepy writing assistant. He's why I don't really work at cafes or anything. So he's a good person, buddy. So adorable. And only one is presentable to the Miami book. That's the truth. The rest are so naughty. They're locked in the bedroom. Yes. So I want to thank you both. Thank you so thank you. much. And Francesca, we wish you the best of luck with this new novel. I'm oh. sure we're getting tons of orders this week. Um, thank you so much to our viewers for joining us tonight. We have many more virtual events coming up, so please follow us on social media, right. sign up for our email blast, don't miss out on anything, and we look forward to seeing you. Um, books and books, and thanks to people on the gang. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you to everybody for joining us. Have a great evening. Stay safe. Good right. night. Thank you. Thank you.